Welcome to the Power of Love show sponsored by the Dee Dee Jackson Foundation, where we shine a light on loss and grief and how it impacts our lives. We are here to provide hope, resources, and a community so no one feels alone in their grief. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Power of Love show sponsored by the Dee Dee Jackson Foundation. We are here to provide hope, resources, and a community so no one feels alone in their grief. We believe that through the power of love, that nothing is impossible as long as you have love on your side. I am TJ Jackson, and with me is my eldest brother, Taj Jackson. What's going on, T? Nothing much, Taj. Uh, for those who are watching, we, of course, are live on Facebook and YouTube, but you may also be listening to us via podcast on one of the many different podcast platforms. The only thing we ask if you're liking our content is to make sure you give the episode a like and to make sure you subscribe to uh, our podcast, our show, whether that's YouTube, Facebook, uh, and the podcast, there's always a way to subscribe. And if you're really liking it, we ask you to leave a comment that helps others find us and will help others get the help they may need. With that said, we are not licensed therapists. We are just ordinary people who've experienced loss in our lives. We've been impacted by it, and we have learned from it. And we like to share our opinions in an attempt to help you get through whatever it is you are going through. Saying that if you need professional help, we urge you to seek it and to find it. Please do not rely just on us. Taj Jackson, how was your week? First, you have to unmute yourself. Who yeah. work with? What an unprofessional. I was just, I was just saying, we do this every week, and I, that's <laughs> how I started. In my uh, oh we do my, this every week, we and I never like this. It's, it's been a whirlwind, like you know, in general, like in. Um, I don't even remember honestly what was <laughs> this week. I did celebrate um, Toria's eleventh. Uh, we a Brazilian thing is that you do every month. You celebrate you know, for the first year of their birthday. And so okay. we did do that, which was great. But then besides that, it's just like, it's all, I'm on, a, I'm on a diet right now. That's the thing. Yeah. So that's what so I'm freaking me. I am going to ask you a question about your diet, but I, I do want to tell you that this quickness in your week and how it just all feels like it's blurred and nothing is called being a father of two young kids. Being a it parent. Just, yeah. Being a, a parent of two kids will just make you feel like, Time is just flying. So yeah, this, this, we'll, we'll know, give you a pa- we'll give you a pass on that. Now talk to us real quickly about this diet. How's that going? It's going well. I mean, I'm also I, I got an Apple Watch, so I've been kind of uh, doing steps, just walking and stuff. Good for and you. And you know about me, I don't walk at all. I, I mean, I'm yeah. very, I sit down a lot, but it's been really cool in that way too. So I'm excited. I'm excited Good. to get healthier again and to lose weight. I will say this, our guest, this is a little foreshadow, or I guess a little, uh, what's the word? A little tease. Uh, our guest, I think you're going to get a lot of too. I mean, we all are, but especially with everything you're saying, uh, I think it's going to be cool. So anyone who's feeling like Taj, where you're just in, in a rut of just sitting still or not doing much, I think this will be a great show for you. And and I shouldn't say feeling like Todd because I was the same way until I got my walking treadmill. That's been helping. <laughs> Your walking treadmill. Oh, yeah. it helps me a lot, Taj. Yeah. Um, as for me, I'm trying to think. <laughs> I, I was saying about how that fog, that blurriness is because you have two young kids. And now that I think about it, I can't even think what, what I did this yeah. week. So I'm in no better position. I feel like no, I wasn't trying to go see a movie. It didn't happen. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know myself, Taj. Yeah, that's I don't crazy, know. Right? Maybe it's strange, and I would say it's the COVID fog, but it's not. So I, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, um, okay. So we did the intro. We talked a bit about our weeks. I think we're ready to just jump into our show. If that's cool with you, Taj. I would love to. Yeah. Cool. So. On this episode of the Power of Love show, we are welcoming a special, special guest. His name is David Richman. After working in a variety of industries, including launching two, not one, but two startups, David Richman entered the financial industry as an advisor. Several years in, he found that his interests were among, were more in managing people and business, businesses than in managing money. 
Among other pursuits, David now works with a nationally recognized financial services firm committed to keeping the advisor in the forefront. Over the last 10 years, David has completed over 50. This is amazing, you guys. He has completed over 50 triathlons, including 15 Ironman distant triathlons, more than 50 runs longer than marathon distance, including several 24-hour runs, running 85 miles in Mexico in the heat of the summer, running 104 miles straight from Santa Barbara to Manhattan Beach. I can't even fathom that. And most recently, biking 4,700 miles in just six weeks as he met with the participants of his upcoming book, Exploring the Emotional Side of Cancer. Telling you, all of that running and all that bike riding has got my mind even tired. Um, But I'm so curious to hear what David has to say about this and, and how he got into it. But let me finish with the bio. As a former sedentary, overweight smoker, David knew that he needed to focus not on what others wanted out of him, but on what he wanted out of life. Through lessons learned in business and sport, David introduces the concept of the middle of the pack and discusses how to get more out of ourselves than ever imagined. He applies this concept to life and business and adds value to the people he works with, coming from the perspective of the middle of the pack. David was born in Miami and raised mostly in Los Angeles. He and his wife split their time between homes in Southern California and Southern Nevada. He has worked in real estate, lending, construction, started both an animation company and a skincare company, and then went into financial services. He has college-age twins who are as aspirational as their father. After losing his sister to brain cancer, David has organized a yearly fundraiser in her memory the most recent being the impetus for his upcoming book, Cycle of Lives. 15 people, stories, 5,000 miles, and a journey through the emotional chaos of cancer. Without much further ado, please welcome the one and only David Richmond to the Power of Love show. David, there you are. How are you, man? What's up, guy? I got to meet that dude, man. What the hell? Yeah, I'm telling you. I mean, that... (laughs) David, I, I'm serious. You got me tired thinking of all you have done. That is amazing. Yeah. Seriously, amazing. seriously wow. amazing. Um, yeah. And guess what? I, I didn't I didn't run my very first time till I was 38 years old. Oh, Ooh. really? Mm. When you say run first time, was that like a half marathon, 5K, half marathon? No, run my first two minutes. And I couldn't wow. even handle two minutes. Wow. Like the first time I ever got active as a, an adult. So I was active as a kid, but but up until about like 17, right? Mm-hmm. Then from 17 to 38, not a thing. Nothing. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, I, I'll go skiing yeah. every once in a while or yeah, yeah. something like that, like 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 walk across the street. But, but no runs, no. Nothing athletic until wow. I turned like 38 years old. Good for wow. you. Good for you. So, so for anyone out there who feels like they can't get into it or they're too late to start, that's just not true. That is not true. And David is living proof. Anyways, I do have some questions that I have for you, David, and I'm going to have that are written down and I have, I'm going to have more as well. And the community will have some, but I'd love to know, we'll start with where did you draw the inspiration from to make these huge changes in your personal life from an overweight, sedentary smoker to pushing yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally? Well, I think it was um, not inspiration as much as it was like um, an awakening. And, um, you know, a lot of times, I mean, you guys know this more than most people, but a lot of times transformation comes out of grief or comes out of loss or comes out of trauma, right? Because you're forced to like measure like, what the heck am I going through? What have I gone through? Where am I going? Like what's happening in life, right? That's something that I think everybody can relate to. For me, the trauma was kind of multiple things in the one short time frame. So, the short time frame, I, um, I was I had to get out of an abusive relationship. I was married to an alcoholic. I had a four-year-old twins, needed to get us to safety, and you know, I, I, I just, I had just found out my sister was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and I'm like. 
I just had a conversation with a friend of mine and I was complaining about my life and all the difficulty and the hard times and the whatever. And he looked at me and he goes, dude, he goes, you got to stop like dealing with the burden of everything that you've gone through and stop trying to pet rabid dogs and take a look in the mirror and fix yourself. And I'm like, whoa, like that's, that's not me. I'm supposed to fix out of everybody's problems. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. And then, and then all it did was ever get me into trouble. I never really like focused on the guy in the mirror. So I don't know that it was like an inspiration, but when I got me and my kids to safety, when I kind of took a deep breath and realized, man, you know, you, you have been living the wrong way. Like then I that got me to ask the question, which way do you want to live? Mm. And I just kept looking. I, I literally not even figuratively, like I stood in front of the mirror and I'm like, like, who the heck are you? And what are you doing? Who do you want to be? Like, what, what the heck, man? And I, 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 I tell people in retrospect, I go, I learned a lot of hard lessons in life, but I just never learned how to apply them to myself. Mm. So, so it was more like a, 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 a first step on a pathway than like inspiration to change or anything. I just said, man, I got to figure out who I'm going to be. Yeah. And that's, that's where it started. I, I have a question in terms of um, that friend that told you that, that hard, hard um, message basically. How did you take it originally? Did you did you uh, did you take it kindly, or were you kind of? Oh, I was ready to take him to the mat, Todd. I was ready <laughs> to take him to the mat. I'm like, yeah. you uh, you you know what a good person I am. You know how hard I try. You know how much I'm I'm going through. Like, why is why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why is she this way? Uh, and he looked at me. He, he used to call me Sparky. He goes, Sparky. He goes, Let me tell you something. Everything in your life is a rabid dog. And you think you're so great that you can go up and pet the rabid dog and it's not going to bite you. Mm. He goes, why don't you stop petting rabid dogs? Why don't you try to fix yourself? And I'm like, oh, yeah. But at first, no, man, I wanted to take him down. I'm like, what the heck, man? I'm not the problem. But he he really showed me. I, I heard it at the right time. He said the right thing at the right time. And I, and I had to admit that that was an opportunity. Yeah, I had never dealt with my own problems. Like, I, I got to fix myself first. And I had never even... Yeah looked at myself really you know fatma says so true you are the only one who could fix you and built the most important relationship with yourself um i, I will say this uh david i know people who've done marathons i mean i actually did one uh i haven't <laughs> i haven't been close to, to ready for a second one but i did one and I, I it was one of those things on the bucket list but it was so challenging and for someone Whenever I hear about someone who does triathlons and, and especially Ironman, it's 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 you guys are a whole nother level. So <laughs> I, I again, I know you get this a lot, but I'm truly amazed and inspired by just how you can go from that transformation um, from really doing nothing to to being at that level. Now, the question I have is, what made you go to that extreme? Like most people, I think, would go from there to working out three to five days a week, a normal way. But you went to like Ironman status. What made you go to there? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And I didn't uh, plan to do it. Right. All I planned to do was I said, uh, geez, man, you know, you just found out your sister's going to going to die of cancer. I, it's the first time I heard it, even after smoking for 20 years, first time I heard it, smoking causes cancer, right? I had to face that reality. I mean, that wasn't her issue, but that, that was potentially going to be my issue. I had two young kids. I wanted to be around for them. So all I wanted to do was figure out how to not smoke and how to lose some weight so I can be healthier, right? Because you, you can't run and swim while you're smoking, right? Mm. You know, so so you got you to gotta do something. So really the motivation was just how can I feel – my life was something that's going to put me in a healthier state. But then um, for, for me, some people, it's other things. But for me, when I started to do longer runs and longer bike rides and I started to set my goals higher, I, I found a, a space to contemplate and a space to quiet my mind and really start to take a hard look at myself and at life and how I'm interacting with the world um, what I, what I want out of the world. I mean, we, uh, you guys both just said it. You said, what the hell did I do last week? Like it's life's so busy. We're all so mm -hmm. busy. When do we ever just sit back 
and and really go deep with how we're interacting with life, what we're getting out of it. Are we putting our time in the right place? Are we getting, are we making the right impact we want to make? Are we treating ourselves well? Are, are we treating the people around us well? We don't get to do that because we're all just so busy. Mm. And so if you, and it's a little selfish because it takes you away from other things, but if you're running four hours in the desert or you're doing a six hour bike ride, man, you get to address a lot of those issues. So it became, uh, sorry for a long answer, but it became um, uh, alluring to me. It was a draw to me because it was a place where I could solve a lot of problems, contemplate a lot of things, um, really set a roadmap for changes I wanted to make in myself. And so it, it just was a it, it was a draw more than anything else. I think that's a great answer because I don't think when we think about people who do long runs or marathons, Ironman, any of that stuff, we don't, we never look at the value of alone time and the thinking that you get to, to achieve and, and the growth mentally and spiritually you probably get to experience being by yourself and having that alone time. So I, I love that answer. I mean, when I think about, it's true because that's one that when I would train for my runs and I do what I thought was a lot with well, 13 miles for you, that's probably just a walk around the block. But <laughs> when I would do that, it, 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 I would spend an hour or whatever it was, an hour and a half, two hours, whatever the time was, um, by myself. And I, there was a lot of growth in figuring out who you were that went, ha went on. And I, I guess going through a challenging time in your life, that was something that, that was good for you. You know, as CKD says, he went from zero to 1,000. Um, <laughs> that is very true. Uh, they also come out with just pure inspiration. Very cool. Um, this is another comment I wanted to highlight, though, David. It's from Clara, who says, thank you, David. It's true. But sometimes it's so hard to pass the struggle. I'm divorced, kid with autism. I was beat. And after 10 years, I found the power to leave for kids. But it's hard. I wanted to just bring up this comment, David, just in case if there was something you wanted to tell Clara. Yeah, Clara, listen, I, I, I can't. I can't preach or prescribe i'll tell you something i uh, i used to beat my head up against hard all the time like really like like that's just like it's like a force that you want to beat up against for me what endurance athlete athletics taught me and, and sometimes business too but because i was running you know i was running a very very large business for for a major wall street firm for many years but but i would bang up against hard and then i learned how to embrace hard and, and I know that sounds like cliche-ish, but it's really, really not. If you can just accept the fact and you can live with and be at peace with the fact that it's going to be hard, then you can stop banging up against the hard and start going towards what am I going to learn? What, what are the steps I need to take? You know, and, and man, some things you can't overcome, but I think a lot of stuff you can overcome if you just stop fighting with how hard it is. You know, like it's supposed to be hard. Like accept, accept that. I was just talking about that last last night in a in a in a group setting with a bunch of real athletes, right? I'm not the real athlete. These guys are real athletes, and they were like, "Oh, you know, like what's your what's your key?" And and everybody's giving their key, and I go, "My key is, I expect it's gonna hurt every time. Like I expect it's gonna be hard. I'm gonna expect that I'm gonna say a bunch of curse words in my head at some point along this thing, and I'm gonna want to quit a thousand times. I expect that. So when that happens. It's not as hard. Mm -hmm. uh, she says thank you to uh, David, which is very sweet. Uh, and and then I have to, and I have questions, but I have to, some of these comments are brilliant. Jennifer says, not to sound cliche, but David is the definition <laughs> of man in the mirror. <laughs> so that's great. That's so, uh, that's so hilarious. But, but look, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But look, it's hard to look at the man in the mirror, man. Right? It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so David, back to my questions that I have for you. I, I was having fun with the with the the viewers' comments, but um, tell us about the inspiration behind your latest book, Cycle of Lives. What compelled you to write this book, and what was the process like? Um, well, so uh, you guys uh, take action because you saw a need, right? You deal with people that have loss and grief, and you you go, I want to. I want to make a difference. I want to, something touched you, right? Something, something pulled you in and said, oh my gosh, this is an area that needs attention. And, and we, we want to get involved in that. We want to make a difference. For me, that happened when my sister was dying of brain cancer. And 
um, we we were very close. We had a lot of really close discussions, and and the dichotomy was when I was at that low point in my life, I decided I'm going to make a journey to see who I can become, right? And at that same time, she was on a journey to know that she was certainly going to die, right? So we have very different paths at that time. It gave us an opportunity to talk really deep. But I noticed when I did these endurance events and sometimes when I was doing fundraisers for her and they were around the cancer organizations and stuff, I realized that people were really good about dealing with the tasks of their trauma. Like, how do I go see a doctor? How do I get more physically fit? How do I reduce stress in my life? How do I get a meal for my kids while I'm in the chemo chair? Blah, blah, blah. These things are good about, but what they were really not good about. And it didn't matter if they're a doctor, caregiver, patient, loved one, survivor, was about the emotional side of it. It's very isolating, very quiet, very personal space. You know, people like to get to their room because they don't want to do the wrong thing or step on toes or, you know, whatever, bring people down. There's a million reasons why. But I noticed that people didn't didn't, uh, didn't have the tools that allowed them to make the connections with people in their lives over these emotional issues. I could drop off a casserole any day, but to ask you, are you frightened about the fact that you might die, that's that's a hard question to ask, right? And so I was just uh, pulled in by that concept. And and that's that's what started the project. Why why did you decide to share 15 different people's 15 people's different stories? Oh different man, different you, you guys you guys work with a lot of people, like a lot of kids and stuff, and you go, well, why a hundred or why ten? Because everyone is different. Every mm-hmm. every single person's journey is different. Every trauma is so unique to them. And so what I tried to do with the number of stories was get a range of you know diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences, all different kinds of trauma, different emotional reactions, you know, cancer one time or they were an oncologist for 40 years. Um, they only had the fear of cancer or they had to live with it their whole life. I just wanted all these different things that make make it up because I might be inspired by one person's story, but it's really hard for me to really identify with that. But there's something I can identify with in somebody's story. And you, when you got that many stories with that much diversity, it just gave me the ability to give the reader, I think, a really good like, kind of like 360 view of how people are able or more oftentimes not able to uh, uh, navigate the emotional side of the difficult times they're going through or, or have gone through. And and so um, it didn't end up, I didn't shoot 15. I talked to a ton, tons more, but sometimes I wasn't equipped to like get to their, their part of their story or they weren't equipped to tell me the heart of their story. And I, and I needed to like figure out a way over a couple of years to break, break down to the core of it because you guys know this especially with kids once you once you get to the safest space possible where you're not judging people where you're not there to fix them you're just there to listen and connect with them in an authentic way that's where the magic happens mm-hmm. and so it just ended up being 15 people that that i thought i delivered that magic was it hard to get people to open up on such a personal deep level <laughs> yeah for sure for sure it is because um, we carry around these traumas, right? And we go, oh, you know, well, okay, I might have been beaten as a kid, but I'm not going to talk about it now because, I mean, I'm supposed to get over it or I'm ashamed or people are going to judge me or, heck, they had it way worse than me. Who am I to complain or whatever? So we pack that all inside and we just never deal with it. Most people, right? We, we mm-hmm. just don't deal with those traumas, wh- whatever it is, making bad decisions or being dealt that bad hand in life so if you give people a safe space and you listen and you connect with them in an authentic way then it's a little easier to get get people to open up but it's i mean who you know how hard is it to talk to talk about things that are really really deeply affecting our 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 ability to connect on a human and emotional level it's 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 tough i know uh, i assume you know, everyone had differences in their story, stories, mm-hmm. but I'm curious to know about any of the commonalities amongst the participants. Was there anything that you noticed that seemed to be a common theme or anything <laughs> that was common from, from, from hearing yeah. these stories? 
Yeah, well, there's two things it's kind of funny you asked me that because there's there's two things. One thing was like I talked to some literally amazing people, right? Uh, Olympians and forty year oncologists, and this one woman who 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 escaped a four year like, brutally abusive relationship, and like two months later got the first of five different cancers she had for thirty five years. Okay, mm. I mean I met with like people who walked in on their mom committing suicide right like mm. i mean like we're dealing with ridiculous stuff one common theme was every single person at some way at the beginning of our discussion goes i don't know why you want to talk to me my story is not that interesting right which is shocking to me because all everybody's story is interesting everybody has a, a phenomenal stuff and if you connect with them even just a little bit you can realize that man every single person's perspective and experience is just fascinating and can blow you away so that's one thing that i thought, thought was in common on the on the kind of tougher side what was what was the thing that was in common was that there was definitely a lot of isolation even if it was self-isolation around the thought of connecting with people about the emotions of the things they had gone through you know like they were afraid to bring people down they didn't want to like measure my grief against your grief they were embarrassed they didn't want to show weakness or whatever there was a million reasons why but people were very isolating it was very easy for them to go no i'm fine i don't need to talk about it i don't need anything from you or on the other side it was like it was easier to say, oh, geez, I'm sorry this happened to you. Uh, call me if you need me. You know, like it's easier to kind of isolate and abandon, keep our distance, even if we don't mean to do so in a negative way. So that was a very common theme. Well, uh, Suzanne wants to know, what's the biggest lesson you may have learned from these stories? <laughs> um uh, the, each story had like tons of lessons, Suzanne. Okay. They each one had ton of lessons. They're very inspirational stories. They're very uplifting. Sometimes they're a little difficult, but they're very optimistic and forward looking. I, I think my biggest lesson that I, that I learned is I'd say I'm very, I was very uh, used to coming to a situation, assuming that I knew what the person had gone through on some level and assuming I might know what they might feel about things a certain way based on those assumptions right you know like the person standing in the in the line in front of you that cuts you off and says something rude to you and you're like man what a jerk maybe that's like exact opposite of who that person is right so i learned that i gotta have a lot more compassion for what people might be dealing with or what they have dealt with you never, ever, ever know what's in somebody's head, what they maybe just dealt with five minutes ago or what they've been dealing with for 20 years. Like you just don't know. And so my biggest lesson that I learned is to not judge or assume or, you know, kind of like go, go into something, you know, pre uh, predisposed a certain way. But it's like if I if I get the opportunity to make a connection, it's more like learn how to ask the right question or connect in an authentic way rather than bringing my assumptions to the, to the, to the interaction. Are you still in contact with the book participants? Yeah. I, I talked to one of them uh, yesterday. He's just going through an unreasonably difficult time right now. And, and I, and I, I, was, I so wanted to give him a space, but then I'm like, I got to take my own medicine you know, I got to call him and ask him how he's feeling about it. It's just tragic what he's going through. Not, not, not him, but his wife. And, and uh, yeah, so some of them are very, very close friends. Uh, have turned into very good friends. Um, I'm not in, in touch with all of them. Some, some of them, I was like um, the time in their life when they like opened up the journal, wrote a few things down, and closed the journal, and moved on, right? So we got to look in that that journal. So not everyone I'm in touch with, but, but thankfully a few of, of the people in the book, maybe more than a few of really turned into just great friends because they're amazing people. David, what do you hope the reader takes away from reading your book and where can they get a copy? Well, they can get a copy anywhere books are sold, right? Most books are on are sold on Amazon, but um, uh, and all the proceeds from the book are going to support the cancer-focused charities that were chosen by the book participants. So that is a, a really good thing that, that, that I'm very proud to do. 
I guess what I want people to get out of it is, I, I guess, picture this, right? We, we all have a tool belt. And, and, and in, in that tool belt, we, we have certain tools that allow us to interact with people, form connections, you know, bring strengths to our interactions with people, make a difference in the world, whatever. I think it's fair to say most of us, and, and maybe not all, but most of us are not fully equipped with the right tools to connect with people when they're going through difficult times or have gone through difficult times. It's really hard to do. And uh, what I hope people will do is they'll, they'll, they'll read these stories or listen to them because the audible's out too. They'll listen or read these stories and go, oh, okay, that, that gives me another tool to put on my belt. If I get into this situation, maybe I can try this or maybe I can be inspired by that person's story to do this. So. I guess um, I'm just hoping that people get out of it a few more, a few more tools for their belt. I love it. And and I'm going to put this graphic up one more time. You can get it at Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. And and I know Todd is, would want to know, oh, and it's obvious by looking at the screen, uh, is there an audio version, audio book version? Yeah, and he said, he said it too, yeah. Yes, and you know what's really cool? Uh, is I have 15 professional voiceover actors each do one of 15 stories. So, oh, wow. Uh, oh, nice, yeah. yes. Yeah, so book, I, I, we didn't get to talk about it. I know we were short on time too, but um, uh, when I had talked to everybody for a couple of years on the phone, then I said, hey, what's the best way to connect them, but then to get on my bike and connect them? So I, I, I drew a map and I, I drew a squiggly line up and down the, the states and I, and I visited most of them for the first time. And so the in between each story is a tiny little narrative of that bike ride and the people I met along the way and some of the more evocative, inspirational, touching stories of, of people that were, you know, that I met and talked to uh, each day. Um, so I do the little narrative in between, but the 15 stories are each um, uh, by a different voice actor. So you could literally listen for 12 minutes and be done with the story and, w and move on, or you could, you know, listen uh, for, for multiple stories, but it's not like one string. But sometimes with, with with books, it's hard because there's so much to do and life gets so busy, you start to read a book and then you don't want to pick it up because you're like, oh, I don't remember where I was or mm -hmm. what the mood was. This thing's pretty cool because you could just be done with a story, move on, and then jump to the next one whenever. Now, you bike rode a 5,000-mile journey, uh, yeah. California to Florida and then up to New York. I have a couple questions about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the the first question is how does that work you bike ride for like seven eight hours and then you check in for the day to sleep to paint that picture for me on how that works yeah i wish but let me tell you that there are a lot of universal rules in the in the world but one rule for sure is if you have limited time to ride your bike across the country the wind will be in your face every single day i mean that is and, and look i expect it is going to be hard right so, but, but, oh my God, with the wind every single day and the flat wow. tires and the whatever. So this is that way it went. And it literally took me a year to recoup, but it, it literally went like this. I would wake up at about 7, 7, 15 in the morning, have breakfast, get on my bike and start biking. And I would bike 10, 12, 14, 16 hours to get to my next point. Cause I'm biking 100, 120, 140, 150 miles a day solo on highways fixing flats trying to find food and water um and stopping and meeting people along the way and doing whatever but yeah uh sometimes i i average 11 hours of biking a day for 41 out of 45 days so then wow. i would get up do it again so it was uh it, it i mean it was in one sense it was a wonderful challenge because it's that's a pretty high goal so you know to be able to do it is cool the other thing is, is yeah, I would have rather have done it a little bit more time, a little bit easier. But yeah, that's I, what I, I can't even imagine going on a bike day after day after day after day, 41 out of 45 days doing 11 hours on a bike. So many, I mean, just thinking of it, my butt hurts. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my muscles are sore. My yeah. back even I feel like would hurt. Um, I don't know how you did that. And that's not even the other elements of where do I get water or weather or any yeah. of that kind of stuff. That's just unreal. Yeah. Now, now my wife uh, did support me for a lot of that. So she was in a car like 
bringing stuff and she'd go ahead and tell me where there was an accident to avoid this, avoid that. But, but honestly, the thing that I didn't prepare for, cause I had to go like straight. So what's the straightest point from one, one place to the next is, is the, is the interstate highways. And so what I didn't realize is how much PTSD I would have from biking 11 hours on busy highways where trucks and cars are going 70 miles an hour by you all day long, every day, two feet away. That, was harrowing like harrowing i'm very lucky i survived because yeah. holy cow man people don't care about bikes when they're driving especially on the highway yeah i can only imagine do, were you ever at a point where you're like this isn't worth it i'm stopping or i'm turning around oh 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 yeah can i tell you a super quick story yes please so i'm on this i'm on this i'm in louisiana okay and there's these massive like microbursts that are down the road and i got to get to where i'm going and 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 i and i get to this bridge and i i think the bridge is only going to be two miles okay but i'm on this bridge and and it's the Atchafalaya uh, reserve to my right so you know uh you know alligator and infested you know whatever nonsense no no shoulder no nothing and and it's starting to rain and I gotta get, and I got a bike. So every like minute, I look over my shoulder, I see cars coming, I gotta get off my bike, I gotta lean up against the railing and not fall over, all right? And I'm holding my bike, which is like 70 pounds, and cars are going shoo, 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 like that, spraying me with water and the whole thing. Then I get, I get down, I get on my bike, pedal, 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 and I look back and I, more headlights, I gotta get off my bike, lean against the thing, and that, I did that for four miles, right? Trucks going seven, like mirrors missing me by inches because I'm leaning against the, the railing. It was absolutely harrowing. And the only thing I thought was, man, I just hope like when I get run over or if I fall over that my phone sends the GPS location to my wife so she can get a little closure on, on this is where this is where I died, right? I mean, it was that hectic. I, it was Oh my gosh. I had, I had a lot of stories like that, but, uh, it was, heck. and when I got, when I got to the other side, I, I stopped, I was wiped out. I, oh my gosh, totally wiped out. And I walk into this little convenience store gas station and she goes, Oh, you need a towel. She gave me a towel to wipe off. And she goes, what are you doing out here in this rain? And I go, Oh man, I just biked over that bridge. She goes, you can't bike over that bridge. I go, I just did. She goes, no, you can't. I go, I just did it. She's like, Oh my God, are you stupid? <laughs> yeah, I, I, Suzanne says I can't believe bikes are allowed on the highways over there. That is insane. Not to mention dangerous. I'll be honest; I didn't think they would be allowed. I guess there's some highways that are spacious, but was did you ever get in that trouble where where the police oh. or someone's like you you can't do that or anything like oh, that? Oh, in Alabama, yeah, I, I had a guy. Uh, he, he, Suzanne, you're right because it, they are actually allowed if you get off at the exit and cross and then get back on at the entrance. What you're not allowed to do is cross the entrance and exits because it's dangerous with people getting on and off the highway. But technically, you're allowed on the highways. But I was in Alabama, and this state trooper was writing somebody a ticket, and he stopped, and he looked at me, put his hands on his shoulders, shakes his head, and I go, uh-oh. So I pull over. He goes, do you know where you are, son? And I go, yeah, I'm actually on, uh, on the highway. He's like, do you know how fast you're biking? I go, yeah, maybe like 10, 12 miles an hour. He goes, you know what the minimum speed on my highway is? And I'm like, no. He goes, 40 miles an hour. You reckon you were doing 40 miles an hour? And I'm like, no. He goes, get the hell off my highway. <laughs> like, okay. So, yeah, there were there were people who looked at me pretty funny. Uh, yeah. that guy in Alabama was not so happy I was on his highway, but, um, but I, I, I didn't have a choice. I had to get from point A to point B. So what are you going to do? Amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, again, uh, thank you for, for being here and sharing all these stories and it's very inspirational. Um, I want to, uh, first of all, Taj, did you have anything else before we give, uh, David that, that ending time to talk about whatever he wants to talk about. No, I mean, just <laughs> it truly inspiring in, yeah. in that way. Um, a lot of people know I'm, I'm starting my exercise stuff, but <laughs> I mean, I don't, every story was more tiring in, in terms of my mental. I mean, I think I would have probably rested for 40 days after that, you know, 11 yeah. hour bike ride. And it wouldn't have been for, for, for 40 days. It would have been, 
done 11 hours and then rested for 40 days because I would have been in the hospital Toast. or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, just, David, just very inspiring. What what would you tell someone who's starting that journey, who's struggling, who keeps falling, or you know, who who just can't seem to be getting going with their health and fitness? I would say that don't feel any guilt and don't feel any shame and don't feel don't burden your just free your mind. Like after I looked in that mirror and I said, Okay, this is who you are. Then I started to ask the question, who could you be? But in order to do that, I had to just forgive myself and go, all right, you, you made the choices you made. You are what you are. Just let it go. Like, don't let it burden you. you. You know, don't, I'm always this way or that's just the way I am or what. Just don't, just, just forget it. Let it go. Unburden your mind. And then you could lean into to learning. And for me, the, the exercise, the eating better, the learning about, how do you burn calories and how much does that mean you can take in and that that kind of stuff like then you could learn with a free mind i I love learning and 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 i had never learned about myself so oh my god isn't that cool so i would just say if you're stumbling like forgive yourself just just let it go like stop like just just don't burden yourself with all that nonsense and just start again because Mm -hmm. um you know, if it's important to you, you will do it. There's not a single person that's ever going to listen to this that gets a call from the school nurse saying, hey, your eight-year-old just fell off the swing and broke his arm. Um, I need you to come down here right now. There's not a listener alive doing anything that would not drive to the school and pick up their their, their kid. Mm-hmm. So if it's that important to you, you would do it, right? Yeah. And it's okay if it's not that important to you. But if you make it that important to you, you're going to do it. So just, just make it that important. If that's what you want to do, you will definitely do it. It's great. All right, uh, David, we warned you prior to the show that we were going to give you a minute or so to close out with some some ending thoughts for our community. So are you ready? Sure. All right, here we go. There's no there's no like official clock or graphic. Oh Todd was supposed good. to do that a while ago. So uh, but no, we're just messy. But go I ahead and go, clock. David. And you, you you don't give me a clock. I might go 10 minutes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> All good. What do you want to leave our listeners and viewers with? Um, you know, just just that you you know, kind of what we were just talking about. That like like it, it's it's way easier to be easy on other people because we don't want to upset them. We don't want to like you would never walk up to some somebody that's at a buffet and you would go, "Are you kidding me? You pig! You're gonna grab two desserts? What? Are you stupid?" Like what? Like don't you know what that's gonna do? But what do we say to ourselves? Oh man, I can't have two desserts. I'm gonna be a pig. But god dang, I had a, a, such a hard day that oh, and I haven't had dessert in two weeks. But oh, like like don't talk to yourself the way that you would never talk to somebody else, right? So I would say it, it's kind of easy to to take it easy on other people. Maybe we need to learn how to take it easy on our self talk and just just let it all go. Just let it all go and. And I think that that can also be applied to our interactions with people, like with this book, Cycle of Lives, um, no judging, no trying to fix it, no, you know, no coming with, I got the answers to things. It's just give a safe space, like be free to be authentic and make a connection, even if the connection is with yourself, but be, be free and, and open-minded to, to learn. What can I get out of this? What, what can I overcome? What, what's the good I can take from it? How can, how can I help somebody? Even if that's yourself, but I'm just saying, hey, let's just take it easy on ourselves and, and each other. i uh, sorry if that's a little preachy. I, I don't mean no. to be preachy, but that's what, that's what's on my mind after our conversation. I love right. it. I love it. Uh, so thank you so much, David. There's some comments uh, that I want to uh, highlight real quick before we let you go. Philippa says, this is such an eye opener. You hear it over and over again, but this feels different. Thanks, David. Uh, let's see. Angie says, my oldest sister died of cancer on December 6th, a few years ago, but she will always be in my heart. Uh, Fatma says, my sister also died from cat cancer. Someone's, Oops. At my front door. Someone's at my front door. Sorry, guys. Fatma says, my sister also died from cancer. She inspired me and never complained about her pain and teaches me to enjoy life every day. 
Uh, Cruz says 2020 was my worst year on so many levels and not because of COVID. I lost so many loved ones to everything, but COVID, it was beyond challenging. So I focused on fixing me because that I could do 100%. Um, and Carrie says, your stories are incredible. Jennifer says, please come back, Mr. David. You are true inspiration. And Josephine says, thank you, David. Have a good rest of your week. Come on. There that are, was a Dodger fan saying, of course I'm going to come back, man. Yeah. I'm hanging out with Dodger fans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's actually a couple more comments I actually wanted to highlight real quick. Isabel says, I love running and I do think it helps mental health, but I'm worried about how it could affect your knees. How do you look after them? Long answers to that question, but it um, in 20, oh, look, I, I'm just giving away my age, but in 20 years, I've run thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. And my knees are fine and my hips are fine and everything's fine. If you do it right and you get professional help and you go to physical therapists and you understand proper form and you understand the difference between it's supposed to hurt and it's not supposed to be injured, right? Injury is not good, but hurt is good. Like it, all of that, but but I would say, uh, learn, get teams of professionals, or see a PT every now and then. Talk to a nutritionist now and then. Read read a book on form, like those kind of things. You're gonna be fine. You're literally gonna be fine. Uh, Great, it, uh, it, right? Love it. Okay, so and then we have a couple of uh, a super sticker um, from Bami. My life, my hurdles, and my survival. Thank you so much, Bami. And then Brandy with the super chat says, "Hi, TJ and Taja. How are you doing today? Just wanted to let you know that I'm on my way home and I'm riding on the subway. We have three and a half subway trains in Philly. I'm just praying I get home. Well, Brandy, we hope you got home. I know this was early in the show, so hopefully you got home okay. Um, but thank you both for the donation to our foundation." Mr. David Richmond, I want to thank you one more time again for joining uh, our Power of Love show. I do want to highlight one more time your your website, www.david-richmond.com. Mm -hmm. And you can also go to www.cycleoflives.org. And if you want to email David, you can email him at info at david richmond Dot com And that's R-I-C-H-M-A-N for those wondering how to spell Richmond. Uh, right. David, again, thank you so much for joining. You are amazing. Such an inspiration. You inspired me to keep moving and, and, and move it up a notch. Uh, I will be thinking of you on your, your bike ride from California to Florida up to New York. <laughs> amazing. Um, so thank you so much. On behalf of my brother, Taj, and our entire foundation, we just want to thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Keep doing what you're doing. I love the work that you do, and uh, you're really touching a lot of people. So thanks for thanks for doing this. It's really yes. awesome. Cool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, everyone. We will be back next Wednesday, April twentieth at one p.m. Uh, with more with more info, another show. Until then, please be safe, everyone. Again, thank you to you, David, and thank you to everyone who is watching live. Again, if you miss any of our shows, you can always go on our podcast and check them out there. And that's it, everyone. Much love to you all and adios.